uh, Aubrey Watts for joining us. How are you, Aubrey? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, Aubrey Watts is from the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Um, and before we get going, I just saw this piece by Seth Godin and I, and I wanted to share it with everybody. Everybody who's with us, everybody who will watch this later, um, just have a little think about this. And the title goes, Today, we only get it once. Why waste it? We can spend it in fear or we can create possibility for the next person. We can spend it alone or we can create digital but real connection with, sev with someone else. It, it only takes a day to make change happen. The ocean is made up of drops. So without any further ado, Aubrey Watts, thanks for joining us. Please tell us about your journey. Yes, well, thank you guys. Um, so I am, have been working at the Olympic and Paralympic Committee now for two years, um, just this March, and um, have been in this kind of project specialist role. And my, <clears throat> so my background, though, started off as a gymnastics coach, actually. And that's how I got into the coaching space. And I had an employer one time tell me, hey, like your conditioning sessions are really great for the girls. Like you're doing an awesome job. And I thought, hey, you know what? Like I, that's probably one of my favorite things about coaching is getting those conditioning sessions in. So then I started, um, I was already enrolled in exercise science at Cal State Long Beach in California. And I decided to kind of go the route of personal training. And once I got into the fitness industry, I realized that I miss working with athletes. So then I kind of pivoted into sports performance. And that's where my love for sport and coaching and strength and conditioning all kind of came together. Um, I worked as a sports performance coach at a uh, Velocity Sports Performance, um, which I think they now call Stack. But I transitioned from there to Colorado Springs in 2014 as a assistant strength coach at the National Strength and Conditioning Association here in town, um, where they have their headquarter building. <clears throat> and then worked there as a strength coach. Um, and started having some more opportunities in the coaching education space. So I was working more with personal trainers and with strength coaches and helping them become better coaches. And that's where this kind of love for um, coach education really started. And then I kind of set my sights like, all right, well, what's bigger than the NSCA? And I started looking, um, you know, just up the street at the USOPC and then kind of started building a network around the some employees there as well as um you know volunteering and doing things like that but then um when i saw my job open up i uh, i immediately applied and then kind of cut to here i am now <laughs> yeah brilliant so uh would you right would you describe this as your dream job and uh you know, obviously you've worked up the ladders, the ranks very quickly. Um, tell us how different this is for you working at the highest level, because this is the pinnacle of our sport um, in the country, right? Yeah, I mean... Do you see it that way? It, it is, yes, I do see it that way. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of interesting. You you get to these large organizations, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the Mecca, the Mecca, like they must be doing everything like so amazing. And you get inside and you're like, okay, like maybe it's not the most efficient, but there's still like, I, like I, I had that at the NSCA where I thought like, oh, why aren't we, you know, it's like simple project management stuff or like small things. But really, like I dreamed about working at the USOPC for two years, I think. And like even growing up, I always thought like I wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted to be part of the Olympics. Like the Olympics were like just what you know, could always make me cry, like those freaking PNG commercials would get me every time. So I really, I always had a passion for it. And so even, I, it wasn't until I was here in Colorado Springs that I even knew like that could be a 
job. You know, I, I just kept thinking like, I didn't even know, like the jobs that I kept finding, I'm like, I didn't even know this could be a job. And then once I found out, then I started working towards that goal. Um, but yes, I mean, like, like you, but like I said, it's like, every organization has its pluses and minuses. I, uh, my, the first day at the USOPC, we got the email saying that our current CEO at the time had resigned. And so that was kind of a culture shock for the organization for that year of like turning over of a bunch of new leadership. Um, and then, so it's like brand new leaders, 2018, 2019, they're doing a whole, they did a whole revamp and of our culture, our values, and our mission. And then now 2020, it's like we're dealing with coronavirus and the and the uh, postponement of the Olympics. So the past <laughs> two years I've been here has not been, I would say, ideal for the organization, but it is interesting to watch this change happen and hopefully go in a good direction. Yeah, brilliant. I've already got a first question come in with your presentation slides, Aubrey. And this is from Barry, all the way from uh, England. He said, Aubrey, can you tell us what you think helped you personally climb the ladder so quickly? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I would say, so I had a really great mentor at the NSCA. I, 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 don't, I do not know how I got that job at the NSCA. Like I, I worked hard and I would say yes to everything almost. Like, oh, you need help at the front desk? I can help at the front desk. Oh, you want me to like call, you know, potential members and, you know, do sales. Sure. I can do that too. Like I was just trying to gather as much um, experience as I could when I was a sports performance coach at the, at, at Velocity. And then like, lo and behold, that was exactly what they were looking for at the NSCA. So it just happened like to work out that I had the right experience they were looking for. And then once I got there, um, my former boss, Scott Caulfield, he was so amazing as a mentor. He just would push me to try new things always. And then I still had that same mentality of just like, yes, because it's like, I'm young, I can do it. I've got the time. Um, I'm new in town. I don't have a lot going on outside of work. So after I kind of had these more, I had more opportunities, um, then he really started pushing me of like doing more networking. So the, so it's like reaching out to people um, and just asking like, hey, can I buy you a coffee? Hey, can I buy you a beer? Can we just chat on, you know, what can I give you, Extend. I like, have a phone call. Um, and I would do that like every month, try to find somebody new. And then I would ask that person, hey, do you think I should meet anybody like that, you know? And then they were like, oh yes, here's one or two names. And then it's like that network just kept growing and growing and growing. Um, so once I saw that job, saw the job of the USOPC, or I guess like I was like, how can I get my foot in the door? And I asked my, our executive director at the time and he's like, oh, here, you want an internship at USA Weightlifting? Like, go and do this internship. And I was like, all right, perfect. So did the internship. There's the foot in the door. This, so I was like doing projects for the high performance director at USA Weightlifting, who now is a high performance director at the USOPC. So it's like <clears throat> all these small little little connections was really, I think, what um, like put me in the right position. But um, not to say that like once I I built that network, I was kind of selective at that point of my time because then I also saw like, from a great mentor perspective. Um, Coach Caulfield, he would, he has boundaries set and he creates this beautiful work-life balance for himself. So when I started at the USOPC, they were like, oh, hey, like, what are you, what are you like with like work-life balance? And I said, uh, Friday after I shut off, like, we don't have an event on the weekend. After I'm gone at 5 p.m. on Friday, I'm going to be in the mountains. I'm not going to have any service and I'm snowboarding and you can't get a hold of me. I'm not answering emails. And they're like, OK, no problem. So the fact that I came in with that, no one has any issues with that now. So it's super easy. And I'm so, so glad that I had that opportunity to like start with that mindset. 
versus trying to have to like reel back, which is nice. So that's huge. I I think that's massive and I think you know our core value this month is actually advice and I think the advice that I'm getting from that is um, find yourself a good mentor be willing to say yes right to a lot of things within reason set mm -hmm. boundaries try new things um, and work hard right and and just be outside your comfort zone and watch yourself grow outside that comfort zone would that be a, a fair uh, yeah, That's absolutely. A fair assessment um, of what you said. Yeah, it's a perfect summary. Yeah, because it's like now I was just talking to one of my other, a former Great. intern, and he was, he's like, oh, what have you been doing for work? And then I was showing him all of these, um, like one sheeter things that I've been graphically designing that are around coaching. And so these like coaching resources. And he's like, whoa, I had no idea that you could do this. I said, I had no idea I could do this either. So it's just a, saying yes and exactly what you're saying like getting out of that comfort zone yeah brilliant and uh, every now and again aubrey the sound is cutting out i can hear you okay right now um so sometimes there's a delay so again apologies for any technological issues i can assure you that it's uh, the high volume of users um, yeah. as everybody seems to uh Set in. I will actually send the recording out to everybody and I'll also share Aubrey's presentation as well that she's prepared. Um, but uh, you know, I want to keep talking a little bit. Um, so Aubrey, just uh, the meteoric rise and the, the way that you've got into the position you're in, number one, congratulations. And number two, I'm sure you haven't sat back and rested on your laurels. You seem like a go-getter. Um, and having spoken to you a few times, I see that and I love that drive. Um, you said something at the beginning there where you said when you were a little girl that you dreamt of working for the USOPC and now here you are, right? Um, and the, your two years uh, has been, it's not been easy, but what, what has been the best part so far for you in, in the two years? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely, um, I mean, you can feel the energy sometimes. Like, I think um, when I was at the uh, Pan Am Games this past summer, I got the chance to go to some of the events and that just really was like so energizing and it was almost like so much adrenaline and just like passion and love for sport that was like all there cheering and I just is like one of those like bringing tears to your eyes type of moments so seeing it in action is definitely you know, it's like, okay, they, these are like coaches that have come through our programs and now I can see them out there on the field with these athletes and then these athletes are now having success and watching that all come together, you're like, okay, so me making these like small resources or the logistics of an event, like it does make a difference in the end. So <clears throat> that's pretty cool. And then the other thing, I mean, like I said before, like doing things that I never thought I would have the opportunity to do before, where I'm just building my skill set immensely is amazing. And then I would say the ability, like I thought at the NSCA, which is, um, you know, they're the certification body for strength and conditioning coaches. And it's just, it was like such a plethora of education there. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to have another job that teaches me as much as I learned there, but I, came to this position now and I was like oh my gosh I've learned so much like how to be a better coach and now I'm almost like should I go back to coaching I, now with all of this extra knowledge I have but we'll um I don't know if that's in my future but it is like yeah. definitely I, I've like to be at a job where you are continuously learning and improving I think is key because otherwise it's like I mean to that quote you said in the beginning, it's like change, connection, it's like all, all these little droplets are just adding up. Yeah, I completely agree and I love that. And you know, anybody who's a regular guest of our webinars, we had Chris Schneider on in February and mm -hmm. uh, Chris is, uh, works with Aubrey 
at the USOPC and in the coaching education department, you said the word passion. And I think just one conversation with yourself and with Chris Schneider, passion just exudes everywhere, right? And I can imagine um, the office when there's a disagreement can be like a, quite quite a fun place to watch as well. So, yeah. but, uh, here's what we're going to do, Aubrey. I'm going to make you the presenter, um, so uh, you can share your slide with us. And then, if anybody can, if you could just hold off your questions, um, because then Aubrey can share her screen, and then I'll take the questions back when Aubrey hands me back the control. Um, you. So what I'm going to do now, Aubrey, is I'm going to make you presenter. Okay. Um, and then you should be able to make the make it back. So I've just done that. So I have the screen. Uh, and then I should be still be able to take the questions. But you have that now. We can see your screen with a lovely mountain where you go snowboarding. Yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're in that so again, everybody, as we, we, we go through this, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for those who will watch this later. We hope you're, you're staying safe, um, you know, and uh, without any further ado, here is Aubrey's presentation. Perfect. Okay. Let me just make sure. All right. And you can see my screen now. Yeah, queuing and the brain what you say matters and then Perfect. a bunch of letters after your name yeah yes <laughs> so <clears throat> those are so a certified strength and conditioning specialist and usa weightlifting certified as well from my strength and conditioning background um i think i should have i, I guess now i can add ms because i do have a master's that i completed just Very a couple nice. years ago but yeah. do you poised. sleep do I With sleep? all these letters after your name, do you sleep, Aubrey? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I still sleep. I actually that so funny you say that. It's like two, I think two years ago. No, maybe a year ago. I listened to a podcast uh, from Joe Rogan with the sleep specialist, Doctor Matthew Walker. And it literally scared me into sleeping more. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely check out Dr. Matthew Walker. He just came out with a book called Why, you, Why We Sleep. And it will totally change your perspective on why you need to be getting seven to nine hours every day. So, And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll attach that when we send out the notes and the video as well. So Perfect. Great. All right. But to change topics, we are talking today about cueing in the brain and what you say matters. So really, um, our presentation objectives today are going to define internal and external cues. Um, we're going to talk about like what is a cue as well, uh, discussing effective cueing for competition and for practice. And then provide some, we're going to do a quick exercise that will then help put this into practice as well. Brilliant. And Aubrey, if I can just jump in there for our, yeah. for our guests overseas in England, uh, queuing is not the kind of queue that we do in the supermarket where we line up and stuff like that. But I'm sure we'll be able to hit on that. Yes, yes. So um, I may have, maybe should have put... Uh, earlier in the presentation but to kind of jump in like what is our ultimate goal for queuing and we're kind of looking for i loved this image of this like transition from like the way that you you the way that you've been coached and then um kind of gathering information and knowledge and then creating this kind of unicorn feedback this like special hit of like the best cue that you can think of that's going to get your athlete to really learn and understand what um, you're trying to ask of them. So um, really we're, we're looking for those, those special cues that make your athletes click, that light bulb moment. Um, so we, and when we talk about um, coaching and cueing, really like we're trying to have this performance-based learning and there's this thing called the uh, performance learning distinction so john wooden um, has said you haven't taught until they've learned because i'm sure 
a couple of you have seen some performance uh, changes. So these are these temporary changes to a skill. You can see them in that training session. So maybe it's you're working on a, a soccer drill and you can get them to perform it in that moment. They come back the next day and you're like, all right, we're going back to like that, that drill that we just were practicing yesterday. And then you're like, what the heck? Where you, have you been doing? I thought that you learned this, but no, they've actually just performed it well. And then now we are look. So what we're trying to do with our coaching is the is that learning piece. It's that relatively permanent change to a skill that can be observed and me measured in future training sessions and in competition under stress in the game. So this uh, quick little. Um, comic I think describes it perfectly so I taught Stripe how to whistle I don't hear him whistling I said I taught him I didn't say he learned it so how many times have we taught a skill they leave they come back and you're like what did we even do this last session so this is where what you say can actually change um, between like make that distinction between performance and learning. Another piece to this puzzle, though, is attention. And so I'm going to play this quick video for you, and it's going to give some instructions, and then I'm going to kind of discuss afterwards. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you stop the gorilla? For people who haven't seen other bird games that you like this before, I mean, how do you miss the gorilla? Did you know about the gorilla? Probably saw it. But did you notice the quick and changing color of the player on the red team using the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a the player, but it's changing from bed to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, oh, and this other unexpected ones. That's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion. <clears throat> so, um, our, so why does it really matter what you say? And this kind of comes back to your athletes only have so much attentional focus. And so you really want to make the most of, of the words that you're saying to them. So attentional focus is the conscious effort of an individual to focus their attention in an effort to execute a task with superior performance. So this is in the game, making the goal, doing and like and having that best performance. What you can notice in this diagram is how the focus changes from a novice athlete to an expert athlete. So as a novice, <clears throat> you're, you're asking, you're, they only have so much attentional reserve, very little, um, extra movement. And so that's why sometimes you'll be teaching a task or teaching a skill. They're focusing on that movement task. They're focusing on what you're saying, what you're cueing them to say or trying to do. And then when you're asking other questions or maybe there's another player involved, that's where things get a little muddy. They don't have as many attentional, they don't have that attentional reserve to focus on other things. So sometimes like when I'm teaching a new athlete a skill, like in, a, in the weight room, I'll say, like, what did that feel like? And they're like, uh, I have no idea because I wasn't even thinking. Um, and in gymnastics, I, I, would, I would say it all the time of, like, 
were your eyes open? Like, what did you feel? And they're like, I have no idea. I think I closed my eyes. I don't know what was going on. So trying to, um, trying to give those perfect cues that allows them with like as, as little words as possible, allows them to have a little bit more focus in that attentional reserve. Once they become an expert, they're not focusing on the cue as much. They're not focusing on that movement task as much because it's more ingrained and they've practiced this enough. And then they open up that attentional reserve. So it's easier to play against a defender or talk about what a movement felt like. And so really what we're trying to do with our cues is moving them from that novice into the expert. And then just to clarify, the cue, so when we look at this coaching communication loop, there's a described phase. So this is the extended description of the activity. So you're really sit, you're talking with the athlete, nothing else is going on. You're explaining everything from the start to the finish, all the different phases of this movement. Um, and then you go into the demonstrate phase. So that physical demonstration of the activity. Then we go into those cues. So this is the brief phase used to bring focus to the activity just before they perform this activity, which is the do. So then the athlete focuses and performs the activity. Afterwards, we've got the debrief. Coach and athlete feedback is considered. And then maybe you go through this loop again, or maybe they go back to do and debrief and you kind of can move along this continuum. But what we're really focusing on today is that cue, that, that brief phase that you, that you are, <clears throat> sorry, phrase, that you tell your athletes just before they perform the movements. So there's two types of cue focuses that we look at. One is going to be internal and the other is going to be external. So the internal focus is on the body and the associated movement process. So that's really like you're using a piece of the body and it's all within their own body. So for example, like if you're doing a hip hinge or let's just say like a, a vertical jump, I'm gonna tell the athlete to extend their hips in their jump. So, because maybe they're not fully extending, getting up as tall as they could. Well, but give us a soccer example. A soccer example. Um, let's see as so it's like extend your leg like extend your leg in the follow-through of a kick brilliant um, external might be so that's where you shifting that focus from the body to something outside in the environment or something on the outside of their body so it's shifting it so it might be like instead of um, extending the leg in the follow through of the kick it's pretend like you're kicking the ball through the goal that's way down like you're you're giving them an external focus that's further away from their body or it could be even like instead of saying kick on the midfoot it's saying kick on this part of your shoe so it's just changing those words just slightly to put that focus on the external piece versus the internal piece. But what I want to know from you guys is the million dollar question of which focus do you think works best for performance? So you guys can start typing in. Um, you can raise your hand or you can tell us. The question is, is which focus works best for, perf for performance do you think number one internal or do you think number two external i don't see people typing in i know there's people out there let me just check <laughs> if they're still on aubrey let me check aubrey we haven't lost anyone oh we've got okay. people ty typing in now uh barry webb says internal with a question mark barry are you sure uh gene <laughs> gene Kopecky is saying external um, thank you for the two that it, it, Barry's like LOL in now because um, he, he wasn't sure. Uh, we'll give it another 30 seconds. Actually, no, half a minute. We'll give it half a minute. Pato um, and, and uh, Debbie, you guys type in what you guys think. Edgar Suarez says external. Okay, so we're 2-1. Vasilis, thank mm -hmm. you. Vasilis Papadagis, good Greek name. 
Uh, me too. Um, Vasilis says both. Both. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that could be it depends on the athlete, right? Yeah. Um, depends on the age of the athlete. Um, is there any more coming in? We're down to the last 10 seconds. Oh, there's another one coming in, Aubrey. Uh, internal, Johnny Turner says internal mostly. Uh, Pato okay. says both for him. Uh, Barry's changed his mind. He's went to external. I think he's Googled <laughs> it and done some research. You guys are brilliant. Keep going. Any others? Let me just call on a few names. Um, Michael Cleary, Steve Sapore, get it in there. Uh, Gary, what do you think? Alison, Alfie, Andrew Crawford, let us know. Um, internal, external, internal, external. This is the race. We're, we're up. We've got a couple with both. Okay. And oh, we've got a raised hand. No, now it's a question. Um, Chuck Kelly says external. Gary Isle says internal. Okay, right. so it sounds okay. almost like a 50-50 split with some people saying both and it depends. There's one more, there's one more okay. and it says, uh, I feel internal is most effective for the youngest and once get older, introduce external. Steve Support is saying internal. Now, Aubrey, let's give them the research and the science of what it actually is. Okay, so the answer, external. Oh, so the biggest thing, so it definitely does matter. Um, so this kind of comes back to like, we have the science to actually prove that external cues are more effective than internal. And so you might be saying like, well, what? I do not believe this, why? Like this completely goes against everything that I coach, which when I first learned this, I thought I was absolutely mind blown. I thought about all the different times I've like taught the basic movement like a squat, for instance, in the weight room and how many internal cues I use. And I thought, oh my gosh, have I really been coaching wrong this entire time? But don't be too hard on yourself because so some of the point of, um, of like what you guys said with both, remember that continue that that communication loop in that process. There is that describe phase, and that is where internal is completely fine. You might be using internal cues there. You might be using descriptive words that are internal, placing like to get them into those positions. But then that cue that they that you use just before they go out and perform that skill is what we really want to focus on being external. So. <clears throat> Internal cues constrain the athlete by putting the focus on the part of the movement at the expense of that whole complex whole. So in contrast, external cues are allowing those athletes to self-organize and focus on relevant movement features. So asking your athlete to, um, like if they're doing a jump and you're saying, like, extend your hips, and meanwhile, in a jump, your ankles are extending, your knees are extending, your hips are extending. You're taking that focus only onto the hips at the expense of the ankles and the knees. So we're trying to think about instead, like if you're then saying explode off the ground, um, then they're thinking like, okay, they're that's thinking about that piece, that whole piece versus one part of that. Well, Bri, so we, we do have a question from yes. Barry, right? And mm -hmm. I think you might get to this within your explanation. You said, what, what would describe fine motor movements, internal or external? So, and I think I can answer that, right? Um, or I'll give it a try and then I'll let you, the expert, do it. Um, so the internal would be parts of the body. So for example, I might say, uh, put your shoulders back. Right, mm -hmm. the external cue might be show me your logo. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Barry, does that answer your question? So, or we carry on. I think I think we've got Barry there. Okay. You said, oh, so, yes, I answered it brilliantly, Barry. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> thank you. Aubrey's the, the expert here. <laughs> yes, yes, I've definitely used that in past presentations, so good memory there too. Yeah, um, so we've got two simple studies here that just show uh, they they both are using, or sorry, so like using balance as the focus. 
So <clears throat> the first one, in both experiments, the athletes were asked to perform a skill they've never done before. For the ski simulator, so this one on the left, um, the first group were giving an internal cue of focusing on pushing off of their outer foot. So if you've ever been on a ski simulator or been skiing, as you're turning, you're pushing on that outside foot. Okay. The external focus group was then giving um, a cue of push on the outside wheels or the outer wheels. So same, I, same concept, but you're taking it from the internal foot to the external wheel. There's a control group where no cues are given, and they just said, hop on and figure it out, essentially. The, uh, the group was then given the same amount of time to practice, and they were called back another day to be tested. So this is where, okay, maybe they were able to perform it, but did they learn it? So that performance learning distinction. And the results of the study showed that the external focus cue outperformed the internal and the control group in both the practice session and the test situation, meaning that they remembered more about the skill in the next session. Okay, so pretty cool. They tried to, they're like, let's try to recreate this. They use a stabilometer, so they're trying to balance on this balance board. Um, the two groups were, were uh, brought in. First group was giving instructions on keeping their feet at the same height, so maybe having that internal focus. Second group was instructed to focus on keeping the markers at the same height. So there's two, there was markers on that balance board, on the stabilometer, and they said, external focus, keep those markers the same height. Once again, external group outperformed the internal focus group. So what does this all mean? Not only can external cues work better for teaching, but they'll help athletes retain this information better. So this kind of, it comes back to that frustrating situation of a coach of, we practiced this all last session. How did you not under, how are we starting back over from scratch again? And it's maybe choosing better words in that practice session to then help them learn and perform this better and retain this information. So. So we do have a question. Yes. Um, and the question is from Debbie. She says, would you agree that external cues give more, crea uh, give more creative ability to children? Oh, that is an awesome question. And I would say, yes, absolutely. And I'm going to get a little bit more into the why of that in just a few slides. Um, so I, I love that question, though, Debbie. Great thought. Yes, you're on the right path. So <clears throat> you may be asking yourself right now, yes, I can get my athletes into those positions though. And, um, you know, like, and maybe they do perform them the next day and they're still fine. And then that, and so they are performing well, they are doing it and then they get into a game situation and, and then maybe they choke. So what we've actually seen, and there's, a re there's some research um, and I'm gonna show the book right now. So choke. Um, by Baylock, they, he started looking at why what you say matters in the performance of an athlete. So the learning brain of a novice athlete. So if we think back to that attentional reserve of the novice versus the expert, the learning brain of a novice athlete, that novice um, attentional reserve, looks very similar to the choking brain of an expert athlete. So an expert athlete could be performing in practice perfectly fine, and then all of a sudden they go back to that novice attentional reserve when they're choking in performance in a game situation. And this is super interesting because external cues have actually been shown to protect against choking. External cues encourages expert-like state, uh, like psychological state. So they're actually, so even as a novice athlete, if you're using external cues, you're preventing them from really getting inside their head, overthinking things, thinking about a piece of that, that movement instead of that complex whole. Pretty crazy. 
<laughs> so we're going to jump into the anatomy of what a good cue looks like and then I believe in the next slide we'll kind of uh, touch back, circle back onto that um, comment that you had made, Debbie. Um, but when we look, when we think about a good cue, we call it the, the three Ds. There's distance, direction, and description. So distance can be proximal or distal, so that's like close, um, close and far. Direction, we're going towards or away or up and down, and then description is a uh, action word, so explode off the ground versus, or an analogy. Um, <clears throat> and the analogy is that metaphor, that story. So, um, and this, this is coming from, so Nick Winkleman has done an amazing amount of research and he just came out with this book. So we've been seeing a lot of his presentations for a while and now he finally has come out with this book. So I highly recommend that if you guys are interested in this. Um, and then the more research he's doing, actually, he's saying that that description, that um, action word or that analogy is really what is making it stick a little bit more. And so coming back to um, Debbie's point of like when you're, so when you're using um, analogies, you can create, like that's where you create a little bit more connection with the athlete. So creating effective cues you can use those internal cues to describe use external cues to coach manipulate those three d's distance direction description and then when you're using analogies consider these four things so familiar you're using something familiar to explain something unfamiliar so that's where it turns into a little bit of a, a conversation with the athlete and a little bit more personal connection with those athletes as well. So maybe um, like, uh, like I'm trying to think of another um, good example. So somebody once told me they're like, oh, Hay's not in the barn yet. I'm like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> And that's because I never grew up on a farm. I had never thrown hay bales. I had no idea kind of what that person was talking about. But if they did, if, if they had talked, if they had sent that same cue with um, like one of my former interns grew up on a farm um, and he would have been like, oh, the work's not done yet. We still gotta, we still gotta grind. We still gotta finish out this session. And that's what he's trying to get the point across. So choosing those words that are something familiar for the athlete to then to describe that unfamiliar that's where you can make those connections and this and this um i guess uh similarities here so again emotional so, so what what resonates emotionally with the athlete so maybe it's you know if their favorite player is LeBron James, it's like jump like you're LeBron James in the NBA finals. Like, oh wow, like this is really gonna, like yeah, that is somebody I look up to, I can see his power, his like, his strength, everything. And so it makes them wanna then perform that same way. Similarities, so highlight similarities and differences. So using what you've already taught them to then say, oh, it's like, it's like this what we've already done and now we're just adding on these extra pieces to this or now it's complex it's like this but um just, just slightly different and then painting that story and telling a story is obviously going to have a huge connection as well um a really great uh, concept that i heard somebody use to describe this one time was it's kind of like a thumb drive <clears throat> where you're looking for that that unicorn cue that thumb drive of a cue where like when you plug a thumb drive in you can then it opens up a bunch of different folders within each of those folders maybe there's another folder there's some documents and they're all saved within these things so it's this like how can you say the most with the littlest amount i guess if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and that actually leads into to uh, Jean's question. Um, and you may again be answering this. He says, um, Jean has said, 
I have found that using demo versus verbal explanation more beneficial to skill acquisition. Is it, it, do you know what I mean? So, you know, one picture painting a thousand words and then mm -hmm. maybe thrown in with those external cues as if mm -hmm. to say, so if we're practicing a turn and if I turn around, I do the turn and then I say, did you notice that when I turned, it was like I was petting a small dog as opposed to saying, bending my knees, you know, then exploding out and stuff like that. Is yeah. that a good notion? Yes, exactly. So I think I think tying it all together, it, I mean, it's definitely like cueing is one piece of that communication loop. So I think it's absolutely key um, to, to your point there is that you have that description phase. So maybe the people that want to know the why, they want to know the exact muscles that's happening and like what's going on, like they get they get satisfied with that description phase and then people are like okay i i can i can hear what you're saying but i don't i can't see it so now you go into that that demonstration phase and the demonstration then has those athletes let it click and then finishing it up with a cue that kind of ties that all together so again it's like that that thumb drive of a of a cue so like a, a good like an example i had with an athlete one time was um we were performing a snatch where you're um, taking the bar from the floor, catching it in an overhead squat position. The athlete would constantly drop their chest, head comes forward, bars at like the bars out of alignment, their back is arching a little too much. And it was almost like they, like if you've ever seen a chicken, it's like they're, they're like making this kind of like head body um, chicken uh like position as their catch and so then what we did was instead of me saying like shoulders back uh you know elbows in line with the ears you know tighten up your core all i had to say was like a which is like a funny chicken noise of like Pah! and then they immediately knew oh i need to get in I'm in my alignment so that one noise even was then able to have three cues associated with that. Plus, tells a story, it's a little bit funny, a little bit more or connection with the athlete, and then I get inside, you know, joke, so. And I think just to build off that, Aubrey, and I think that's huge, mm -hmm. right? Because you talk about the connection there, you talked about LeBron James, um, with the jump in, but I think this ties in to knowing who's in front of you, making sure you have that connection, um, and Absolutely. just being in tune with the psychosocial side of it, knowing what players need what cues at what time and stuff like that. So, yeah, fair. yeah, because I can say that to another person, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that's that's where it's like you, you start to you start to build a better relationship with your athletes, even based on those cues. And so sometimes even like I, I I'll be stumped. So it's like, I don't know what like, I guess I, I, I remember asking like an athlete, um, you know, it's like, what is how, what does this look like to you? What does this feel like to you? And then they're like, oh, it's like a it's like a twirl. And I was like, okay, like a twirl. And I was like, all right, well, I want you to twirl like Elsa. And they're like, oh yes, because it's like little girl loves Frozen. And so being able to then say, I want you to twirl like Elsa. And then she was able to understand what to, she was doing with her hips in this rotational exercise. I then made a connection with her. So, okay, now I know she likes Frozen. And then I was at, get getting or then i was able to have her perform that movement and learn it and come back and repeat that action which was pretty cool yeah and age appropriate and relevant too yeah exactly right. but yeah. goes back to connection and knowing your athletes mm -hmm. yeah so this absolutely it takes practice and like so when you're trying to come up with this it's like there's definitely times where it's like, okay, I thought I started thinking a lot more about the cues I was going to use before practice. And then I would go into the session and then have, be able to utilize those a little bit better. But there's still some times where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how on earth to make this an external cue. So what we thought, uh, um, 
which I think we got from our figure skating coach. She said that she always has this in her bag. They always like athletes usually have some as well. And the and what turns an internal cue into an external cue? Tape. So instead of saying bring your, you know, bring your right hand to your left shoulder when you're doing a, a, a spin, bring the two pieces of tape together. Maybe it's, okay, I don't know how to use, I don't know, there's nothing on the shoe that marks like where I want this athlete to, to kick the ball, put a tiny piece of tape on there. Or maybe it's a piece of tape and then you have a piece of tape on the net and you're like, all right, I want you to get, you know, pretend like you're, as you're kicking the ball, like you're kicking through to that extra, to that other piece of tape over there. So it's just, it's, it's like making that small difference between using that internal and then moving to the piece of tape, just saying like piece of tape versus your foot, for instance, is turning that and it's making a difference at being external, which is crazy. Um, so really thinking about, um, I guess, as you as we're talking about this, is anybody kind of nervous, scared, or like rethinking everything that they have been doing? Yeah, do if, you, if, you, uh, if you have questions. questions, comments, yeah, if you have questions or comments, just type them in. Um, and as Aubrey said at the beginning, it, you don't have to throw the baby away with the bathwater. It's just a, a subtle, <laughs> subtle tweak of what we do and how we do it. Yeah. Um, and then also using your staff, your the rest of your staff or like other assistant coaches, your head coach, whoever, whoever you're working with, like bouncing ideas off of them. Um, is a great idea as well because I like I remember I was trying to get somebody to do a hip hinge for an RDL. I was trying all these different methods, all these different progressions, regressions, um, you know, external cues, like painting different stories. Could not get this guy to bend with like a flat back. He was kept like rounding over doing all this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with this athlete. He's not going to be able to perform this movement. This is very basic. And then I had one of the interns come over and then he's just like, oh, like, you know, so it's like he was an older athlete, luckily 18 ish, but he's just like, oh, Ben, like a, like a stripper. And then immediately, boom, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if it was the most appropriate, but it definitely got him in that position. So it's just, it's like using your other staff to like bounce ideas off of. So like, cause everybody comes from different backgrounds. So like I can say something, it's not going to stick. I'm not going to say it louder because that's obviously not going to work. So instead using different words, trying to paint different stories, asking them what it looked, asking the athletes, asking your staff, like it definitely helps put this into practice a little bit more. Um, but so like on that note, I do want you guys to take a second and try to think about um, putting this into practice. So I want you to select a movement and then, um, <clears throat> so whatever, uh, whatever you've done, I got like a drill that you normally coach. So just take a moment to think about a movement or a drill uh, that you use with your athletes a lot. We call them activities, Aubrey. Activities, okay, perfect. <laughs> well, some people call them drills. Um, and then uh, there, there is a question from yeah. Barry. He says, Aubrey, do you plan to coach or do you plan for learning more? So, during, so, so I yes, think so like, is, yeah, did you get yeah, it? To, to kind of, yep, I got it. So like to, to kind of um, put your, like, do I ever sleep <laughs> uh, comment and I, Still, like I, I, I definitely always have a second job as well. So I was, I'm a gymnastics coach, um, and I was doing that part time, and then I now just like sub whenever they need people. Um, yoga as well, and um, and then I for a brief, I, I was back at the NSCA for, I think it was like 
five months um, as they were transitioning from uh, my boss had left, my old boss had left, and then they didn't have anybody in the in the performance center. So I was just going back in there and coaching teams again. So I'm still putting this now into practice. I definitely am still learning though. So I'm continuously learning and then I'm still trying to at least have something to like make, like put these into practice so that I can get better at actually doing these as well. So. Brilliant. Yeah. Did that answer bit. your question, Barry? Or did you mean your question as in when you are coaching, does you plan more for the cues or plan to learn? And we'll see if Barry pipes in again. But um, as, as Aubrey said now, you know, think of examples that you can put into practice. Um, so then that yeah. way we can reach our objectives of this session. Which yeah. Aubrey so, so yeah, so as you're, as you're um, kind of looking through this, then the next piece after you've selected that activity or that movement, that one movement you're looking at, break that movement up into phases. So maybe it's a, it's a sprint. So as you, you've got your start, you have your accelerate, acceleration, and then, uh, and then like within that acceleration, that sprint, you have that, the two phases of like the knees. So you've got the punch and the drive. So once you understand like the different phases, so is it like, um, is it a shuffle? Is it a crossover like what are the different pieces within that movement um so this question has come in are you still yeah, i thought you were running away sorry no i uh i had to i just saw a note on my no computer worries. that my no worries. battery was um, <laughs> um the uh the, the note from deborah says do you feel being a gymnastics coach gives you a better understanding of how the body works yes if i could employ every youth athlete to just do you know a summer of gymnastics to get some body awareness i think that everybody would move a little bit better repeat um, that aubrey repeat <laughs> that because i'm going to show this recording and this clip simply <laughs> because a couple of years ago in the off season i had my under nine boys and under 10 boys do gymnastics for this exact reason. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I used to sneak gymnastics into the warmups of all of my athletes. So they'd be doing forward rolls, they've been doing handstands, um, balancing exercises, flexibility exercises. Yeah, I think every athlete should do like one season, one summer. Of gymnastics <laughs> but I would I would go I would go further as well and say the way we incorporate tag games and movement games and spatial awareness games and maybe a bit of parkour or jumping here to there um, mm -hmm. those things are, are huge yeah, as well jumping and landing yeah. the the strength that they and like the core strength that they have the balance the yeah. body awareness just teaching getting athletes to just jump on a trampoline sometimes the like you can see so i've seen people get on a trampoline and then they're just this like wet noodle i'm like how do you do you have any bones what's happening here and they just have no idea how to brace or like for so, a jump or like anything like that so as yeah, an it's external really cue interesting. As an external <laughs> cue, Aubrey, they look like those uh, wind feathers of those people that uh, <laughs> the advertising things, you know, those big uh, inflatables. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that, that the car dealerships. Yep. Yeah, that's the one. So this is yeah. this is a question from Liam Lacey. Liam, thanks for joining. He says, how much do you lead the athlete to the cue you want them to use? Question. Um, or, or do you always provide this for them instruction? Does this change from novice to expert? Yes, so that's a really great question and something I actually did forget to mention, which was, so I think if you can come up with the cues, like you, you're gonna have, you're gonna start to develop this, you know, like, like, like uh, oh gosh, this little playbook for yourself of like, these are the cues that work really well. But obviously that's not gonna work for every athlete. Um, so as you're, as you're working, like you definitely use the cues that you like, use the cues that have worked in the past. And then if it's not working, that's when you can start to maybe ask the athlete more like, okay, well, if this doesn't 
if it, if that didn't work, like, what does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? So then they can they can contribute to the conversation. Um, but like, so I think you could go both ways. And, and um, as you get into expert athletes, it's uh, so, some, so they did do some more research on um, expert athletes and and the different cues. So the um, when they did the when they did the similar tests. Uh, so I think this was in sprinting. They did a research study on athletes, and they were giving an athlete an external cue, an internal cue, and nothing. The external cue and the nothing cue, just um, the athlete was able to perform the same. The internal cue actually decreased their performance. So saying nothing and saying an external cue was still better than giving that expert athlete an internal cue. And that was because the athlete already knows how to do this movement. They're an expert at this. But then as soon as you take that into like make them think about a little bit more, that internal, that piece of that movement versus that complex hole, that's when they had a small decrease in their performance. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention on that, uh, kind of around that topic is <clears throat> If you've been coaching with internal cues <laughs> your, this whole time, and then all of a sudden you switch to an external cue, your athlete might be like, "What? What are you saying? Why? Why are you changing the way? You, like changing your words? This is weird." So getting them used to it in practice, like you can't just go out into competition to like uh, I, I can't say tomorrow, but um, <laughs> when we like the next virtual, like next week see your world. athlete. Yeah, in virtual world. Like if you're if you all of a sudden just start throwing external cues into their like right before performance, they might not understand it. So getting them used to that in practice so that you can then go out and use it in, in a game situation is definitely gonna help as well. So because if they've never even even the same as an internal cue, like if they've never heard that cue before and then you're giving it to them in a game situation, they're gonna be like, What are you talking about? So getting them using that, like they need to have practice with the cues as well. Um, so, so I think just, just typed in. Yeah. Deborah's just typed in, Aubrey, and I know we're running close on time. She says, external cues must relate to their experience. So age appropriate, like we talked about, bike riding yeah. kids or cars for all the groups. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect point. Yeah. Yeah. I would not use the stripper cue for a young for athlete. Eight year old. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, um, so think, uh, you guys look at the slide. So so use this use this slide uh, and try to identify some cues. Um, so look at the requirements of the movement. Like is it like a range of motion, the timing, the force? So you can kind of start painting the the bigger picture. Um, think about some common errors that you see, and then identify some cues in that movement, in that um, activity that you could start to use. Write them down on note cards, talk to your staff about them and try to use them with your athletes. And then as you're going down the list, you know, it's like, oh, that one did not work. So cross it off, think of some new ones. Um, the last thing I'm gonna just say, it, coming back to attention, is that it is that limited resource we pay attention to that one thing at the expense of everything else. And so making sure you're guiding them to that right focus and giving them that one cue, that one major focus that's going to say the most with the least. And um, this book really hammers into that one thing um, and trying to and, and attention in general. So that's a that's a good one if you wanted to add something to your list of things to read in this quarantine time. But thank you very much. And you can feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions, comments, um, you know, you want to argue about this, happy to talk. So uh, thank you guys very much though. Brilliant. Thanks, Aubrey. Now, any further questions for Aubrey? Aubrey, I think you can, uh, let me see if I can make myself the presenter again. I think I can. And I've just done that. Uh, um, I think there's 
another question's coming in. It might be a statement. Your passion is infectious, is what Debbie said. Okay, I think that's to me, Aubrey. No, I'm just kidding. That's definitely to you. <laughs> so, it's <laughs> brilliant. So, Aubrey, thanks so much for joining us. We can't yeah. thank you enough. There is another question coming in. I do want to be sensitive to your time. Uh, this presentation was great. From Thank you very much. Um, and then you mentioned the light bulb moment was yours. Thank you in advance. Um, so Thanks. fantastic. So just to, to reiterate, right, um, and we'll close up. Any any questions I should have asked you, Aubrey, um, that I didn't? I think there's a little bit of a time delay. Um, I was saying thank you, Vasilis. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are on again this evening at 8.30, Pambaya. We do have a few other things. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Aubrey and thank you, everybody, who watched this. And we look forward to seeing you. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks bye again, bye. guys. Good luck. Have fun practicing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Aubrey. Bye bye, everyone.